Hello and welcome to Nova Biomedical's educational webinar series. My name is Evan Entrivalas and I'm the Medical and Scientific Affairs Director at Nova Biomedical. We are delighted to have today Dr. Brad Caron from AU Clinic to talk about glucose point of care testing in the hospital setting and more specifically, as the title states, glucose meter use in critically ill patients. Why improved meter accuracy may lead to better ICU outcomes. Dr. Caron is a well-known world expert on laboratory medicine, clinical chemistry, and point of care testing. He is the Director of Point of Care Testing and Hospital Clinical Laboratories at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He received his MD-PhD degree from the University of Minnesota Medical School and completed his residency in clinical pathology at Barn Jewish Hospital, Washington University School of Medicine. As I said, Dr. Caron is an expert on point of care testing and also point of care glucose testing. He was the past chair of the AACC point of care division. Dr. Caron has published a large number of manuscripts and has numerous presentations at national and international conferences in subjects, in subjects related to laboratory medicine. This webinar is approved for continuing education, either through PACE or the CERP. Upon completion of the webinar, you will receive a link with a short survey and instructions on how to print your certificate. Also, there will be a Q&A session at the end of this webinar. Dr. Caron will answer your questions. Without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Caron to start the webinar. Thank you, Evan. Uh, I'm thrilled to be uh, here today with this audience and be able to talk about one of my favorite and most interesting topics, glucose meter use and accuracy in the ICU and why we should all be concerned about this issue. The learning objectives for um, today's uh, session are to list regulatory and clinical issues related to the use of glucose meters for critically ill patients, weigh the benefits of glycemic control uh, against the risk of hospital-acquired hypoglycemia, discuss the impact of glucose meter accuracy on glycemic control effectiveness, and review various recommendations for glucose meter accuracy. And I think we are going to cover all of those, but perhaps not exactly in this order. So I think everyone on this call appreciates the fact that within the hospital environment, we use glucose meters for different purposes. Um, originally, glucose meters were developed for diabetic patients at home to monitor their own glucose. And when diabetic patients become ill and go to the hospital, they will need to have their glucose monitored in order to get subcutaneous insulin dosing and correction of their glucose. And we can assume that the required accuracy for this is about the same as it is for home use uh, of self-monitoring of blood glucose. And we'll talk more about what that guidelines for accuracy are for that use a little bit later in the talk. Glucose meters are also used to screen for neonatal hypoglycemia, and we're not going to talk about that at all today, but that would be a whole other talk with a whole other set of accuracy and, and uh, requirements around error and accuracy for screening for neonatal hypoglycemia. We also use glucose meters to screen for hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia in hospitalized patients who are really not at risk for a glucose um, uh, elevated or decreased glucose or have a glucose type disorder. And so, um, again, we're not going to talk about that specifically. What we are going to focus on through the rest of this talk is when we use glucose meters to manage intravenous insulin infusion protocols for critically ill patients who are on a ICU or institutional glycemic control protocol. And when we do that, we have generally hourly or very often um, 
every hour, every other hour adjustments of IV insulin based on the glucose meter value, and we have narrower insulin dosing ranges and more measurements, more opportunity for error in that context. So what is this glycemic control and critically ill about? Well, I think, again, almost all of you probably are aware of some of the seminal and, and, and foundational studies in this area. And the, uh, although it wasn't the first one ever, certainly the one that's often cited as a, a, a foundational um, study was the study by Dr. Mandenberg and colleagues in 2001. And prior to that, it had commonly been in, in Um, prior to that, um, glycemic control had been commonly used only for diabetic patients in surgical ICUs. In this study, uh, 1,500 patients were randomized into two groups, one which got conventional treatment at the time, which was subcutaneous insulin if the glucose got really high, and one which had intravenous insulin to maintain glucose at pretty normal le levels between 80 to 110 milligrams per deciliter. In this study, there was astonishing findings, including dramatically reduced mortality, bloodstream infections, and kidney failure, and those type of things reduced 40 to 50 percent in patients who had this intensive insulin therapy to keep glucose levels relatively normal, despite the fact that these patients did not have diabetes. One thing they noted in this study, which is uh, consistent with all of the studies of glycemic control, are that the patients who got intravenous insulin had a much higher rate of hypoglycemia about six-fold, the rate of hypoglycemia was about six-fold higher in the patients who were on intravenous insulin compared to conventional treatment. But absolute numbers are important to consider, and overall only about 5% of this intensively treated group developed hypoglycemia during this study. This led to sort of a, a, a revelation and change in critical care practice with many practices and studies trying to duplicate this. In fact, the same investigators, Dr. Vandenberg, Dr. Vandenberg and colleagues, did another study, um, but instead of in a surgical ICU, did it in a medical ICU. They found in this setting that tight glycemic control was only effective in patients who stayed in the ICU three days or more. For those with short stays in the medical ICU, it didn't seem to be in effect, uh, the glycemic control did not seem to be effective in reducing mortality. Hypoglycemia was a significant limitation, and that is a conjecture to have increased mortality for patients staying less than three days in the medical ICU who were put on this intensive insulin therapy. Consistent with the first study, there was a six-fold increased rate of hypoglycemia among those placed on intravenous insulin, but if you look at the absolute rate, almost 20% of patients in this study had one or more episodes of severe hypoglycemia, and um, leading to a lot of conjecture and speculation um, besides a different patient population, medical versus surgical ICU. They also used glucose meters rather than arterial blood gas analyzers to do the glucose monitoring in Levon 2. In subsequent studies, there were mixed outcomes, more negative, meaning glycemic control was actually not effective, or worse outcomes than conventional therapy, than positive. The glucose targets in various studies varied, patient populations varied, nutritional support varied, so there are a lot of differences between studies. But what's almost always fine is that the rate of hypoglycemia when you do glycemic control is about five-fold higher than the rate in conventional treatment. And you can see both Luvon 1 and 2 had that five, six-fold increased rate of hypoglycemia when you do strict glycemic control. Again, the first study that was the most positive in terms of outcomes did use arterial blood gas analyzers, not glucose meters. Um, to do the glucose monitoring, and most other studies did use glucose meters or have mixed methods between centers, leading to a lot of speculation about is the monitoring device important. So why are we so concerned about hypoglycemia? Well, we know that a single episode of severe hypoglycemia, glucose value less than 40 mg per deciliter, is associated with increased mortality in the hospital. 
In fact, a single episode of hypoglycemia increases your risk of death in the hospital about twofold, and I've given a reference for that here. Um, this um, investigator in this paper, Dr. Crensley and colleagues, did a sensitivity analysis within their using their data to understand um, how much could they increase hypoglycemia until it would completely offset any potential benefit of glycemic control. And they found about a fourfold increase in severe hypoglycemia was predicted to completely offset any survival benefit of doing glycemic control in the first place. So it's important to consider the risk of hypoglycemia and built-in systems to prevent hypoglycemia in the context of glycemic control. And again, these, these observations that some of the better studies that had better, some of the studies that had better outcomes didn't use glucose meters and some of the mixed and negative studies did, led to this idea of, well, maybe the glucose meters are leading to measurement inaccuracy and leading to hypoglycemia during that glycemic control, and could that be a problem? Well, why would we think that the glucose meter would be the problem and lead to hypoglycemia in this context of glycemic control or tight glycemic control? Well, we know there are a number of factors that influence the relationship between whole blood glucose meter and the true, which we usually consider to be lab plasma glucose value. What glucose measures, as glucose meters measure, is whole blood um, and whole blood glucose which is used as in all meters commercially available, a standard conversion factor to convert that to a plasma equivalent value so that lab and glucose meters are reporting the same number. We know sample type is an issue, capillary venous arterial, we're gonna talk about that, and then medication and other types of interferences. So we'll go through all of those limitations of glucose meter use in the next few slides. So whole blood versus plasma, in, in, the, in the body, whole blood glucose will be about 15% lower than plasma glucose if we just measured most. But this caused confusions in hospitals, so in the U.S. now, all the vendors now calibrate their hospital use glucose meters to express these plasma equivalent units so that theoretically whole blood um, glucose meter values will be identical to plasma glucose measured in the lab through use of this conversion factor. So what is, goes into this conversion factor? Well, it, it makes assumptions about the water content of plasma, so PW, plasma water, the water content of red cells, RW, red cell water, and the percent of cells in whole blood or the hematocrit. Um, in order to have apples to apples, the vendors of glucose meters in the U.S. have agreed to a standard conversion factor that takes into account the normal person's plasma water, red cell water, and hematocrit values. And uh, now a few years back, and Dr. Uh, Martha Nandru Lyon um, did a study to say um, how well do these assumptions hold up when we assume normal plasma water, red cell water, hematocrit in various patient populations, how well do those assumptions reflect um, the patient's true values and what would the impact of um, incorrect assumptions be? So in this study, uh, Dr. Lyon and Dr. Lyon compared plasma water, red cell water, hematocrit value among outpatients, inpatients, and adult ICU patients. In the adult ICU patients, the mean and distribution of plasma water, red cell water, and hematocrit differed markedly from the assumptions used by all the glucose meter manufacturers in the conversion to whole, from whole blood to plasma equivalent glucose units. Lower hematocrit and higher plasma water in adult ICU patients were predicted to result in about 8% of all results having more than 10% error at a value of around 180 milligrams per deciliter. And I know that's like 10% of 10%, so a little confusing, but uh, I'll make that a little more clear in the sli on the next slide. So this is a slide from the paper that, that we published here. Uh, at Mayo a few years back, and it compared two glucose meter technologies, A and B, one that has hematocrit correction, one that doesn't. And you can see that meter A, that at very, uh, various levels of hematocrit, there was no systematic bias um, in the glucose meter measurement compared to a lab reference method. 
On the other hand, in, in meter B, that did not have hematocrit detection and correction. At um, low hematocrit values, the, the glucose meter would, at a minimum, lead to a 10% overestimation, and at high hematocrit, more than a 10% underestimation. So that swing between 10% over and 10% under, 20% range of values that you can change depending on the hematocrit. And so this hematocrit interference is one of the big issues in um, using glucose meters in the critically ill, because we know critically ill often have usually very low, but in general very abnormal hematocrits, and that's going to lead to inaccuracies in glucose monitoring and measurement. Sample source is another big issue in the ICU, and this has become more and more of an awareness and issue about the limitations of capillary blood sampling in the critically ill versus arterial or venous whole blood glucose. We know that blood pressure, edema, shock, tissue, tissue perfusion, and other things, which other variables which are incompletely identified, can lead to outliers and inaccurate measurements in capillary whole blood glucose. And I've given you a few references that are commonly cited in terms of these limitations of capillary sampling in the critically ill. But despite the many publications, which are largely some case reports or some um, um, prospective studies among patients highly at risk of having poor capillary perfusion, um, the real limitations of capillary sam sampling are largely unknown. Most of the studies, the case reports, and smaller series were done with older glucose meter technology. And so how much of the limitation is physiologic, the capillary glucose value simply doesn't reflect circulating whole blood, venous, and arterial value? And how much our technical, technological limitations of the meters themselves really remains largely unknown is one of the most interesting areas of research to me. And we've done a few studies here at Mayo Clinic, but I'm not going to tell you about those today. We're going to uh, tell you about those another day. Well, what about arterial and venous blood? If capillary is limited and we're, risk, we're concerned about capillary sampling in the ICU, then we better use arterial or venous. Are those two sample sites interchangeable? Well, the answer is maybe or maybe not, depending on which technology you use. And so there, I've shown you three publications, including one we did here at Mayo, that showed that venous whole blood glucose, uh, glucose meter glucose, overestimates the true venous lab plasma glucose using when glucose meters are used in critically ill patients. Um, and in one study, I'm going to show you a few results from that we did here in 2009. We actually found that the glucose meter technology did make a difference in how accurate venous whole blood glucose from a venous catheter uh, was. So this is just a figure from that um, paper, and you can see what we've done in this um, study is we took um, venous whole blood from a central venous catheter. So we have central venous catheter blood. We test that venous catheter blood on a glucose meter, and we send that same sample to the lab for a lab glucose. So it's not an issue of the catheter is inaccurate because there's exogenous um, dextrose in there. If there was, we would measure the same glucose on the meter and in the lab. This is the same sample dosed on the meter and sent to the lab using two different meter technologies. The old in form one did not have uh, various interference corrections, and the newer technology, the stat strip. And you can see that there's variability in both, uh, which we don't really understand, but very clearly the older technology, uh, the in form one, there were many more values that were 20 to 30 milligrams per deciliter higher on the glucose meter than on that same venous catheter sample sent to the lab. So this suggests that, yes, glucose meter technology does matter, and there are probably specific interferences in play when we use venous catheter whole blood for measurement, which would make one technology um, better than another. Despite the fact that there are limitations to venous catheter blood use for glucose meter sampling, because of the concerns and regulatory issues around capillary sampling, more and more places are doing more and more venous catheter sampling. So my recommendation is you assess the technology you use in terms of its accuracy specifically uh, for venous catheter whole blood. 
And then interferences, and I think people are generally aware of the fact that the newer glucose meter technologies are susceptible to fewer medication interferences, and that's going to be a good thing because, again, it's similar to hematocrit interference. If you can fix something with a better technology, then you don't worry about errors related to ascorbic acid and maltose and um, other um, acetaminophen and other interference. So this is a slide I've used in the past that tries to summarize all of the um, types of error, sources of error and outliers with whole blood glucose meter measurement and the sample type you would be most likely to see that error with. So you can see shock, hypotension, dehydration, edema, tissue per low tissue perfusion being really relevant to capillary sampling and the reason why we have a, a, a sort of concern about capillary sampling in the ICU and why we need to know more about what its limitations are. Hematocrit effect is going to apply to all sources, capillary venous arterial, again, underdosing, failure to let the alcohol dry, largely issue with capillary sampling. Plasma, red cell water effects, um, I'm guessing are a fo um, um, an issue with all sample types. And I've always speculated that some sort of viscosity or, or water effect might explain why different technologies are less or more accurate when venous catheter blood, central venous catheter blood, is used. And then the, the last several medication interferences, um, competency and, and temperature storage issues are going to be relevant um, to all sample types. So that would be, wouldn't matter what sample type you're using for those types of errors. So that's a brief overview of sort of the issues at play here, the need for glycemic control, the risk of hypoglycemia, and the technological and physiologic limitations to glucose meter use for ICU glucose monitoring. And, um, you know, when we go back to the history of glycemic control outside of diabetic patients, it only goes back to 2001. That's not very long in, in terms of uh, medicine. And a lot changed in a small period of time, and, and many of us were around. And we went from never using our meters in the ICU to doing glucoses every hour on lots of ICU patients for glycemic control. And this really was a big change in why and how we're using meters, and it caught the interest of regulatory and guideline and evidence-based groups. So glucose meter regulatory issues timeline in March of 2010, after about a decade of a shifting change of glucose meter use in the hospital, the FDA held a public forum on glucose meter accuracy. And the consensus was that the guidelines that had been used by most groups, the 2003 ISO guidelines that really said, if you're within 20% of the real value, the glucose meter is OK, was not appropriate for glycemic control in the ICU. And there was a debate about whether there were separate accuracy criteria that were needed for hospital use or ICU use or home use. And the FDA announced that for the manufacturers, new accuracy criteria for would be forthcoming uh, soon, as you'll see though. It didn't happen very soon, but it did happen. So again, 2001 was Vandenberg and the shift in use of glucose meters in the ICU. By 2010, the FDA started to ask, do we have the right accuracy guidelines? In 2011, the National Academy of Clinical Biochemistry came out with a somewhat more stringent accuracy requirement. Instead of 20 percent, they said oh, they should be within 15 percent. Glucose meters should be within 15 percent of the real value 95 percent of the time for glucose values above 100 and within 15 mg per deciliter and for values below 100. In November of 2012, when uh, a company was trying to get a new AccuCheck in form approved by the FDA, um, the FDA sort of publicized um, something they said they'd all, a stance they always had, but people were generally not aware of. And that is in the approval of this particular device, they, they require the manufacturer to put in sort of a bigger, bolder limitation statement saying the performance of the meter has not been evaluated on critically ill patients, which made it not waived or off-label use. And, and the FDA said, well, we always meant that. But um, they furthermore clarified that point that that limitation of statement would apply to all currently FDA-approved hospital use glucose meters. 
that um, they were never approved for critically ill patients and that, that use is off-label and therefore not a wave test at that point if you're using the meter in the ICU. That FDA um, stance caused a lot of concern um, and led to a lot of questions. Okay, so what is the required accuracy for this um, glycemic control in the ICU type of use? In January of 2013, the CLSI revised uh, guidelines, POCT 12A3. Um, remember, we started at 20%. We went to 15% with NADCB. Now here we are with CLSI saying for glucose values above 100, 95% of the time, the meter should be within 12.5% of the true value of glucose values above 100, 12 mil, within 12 milligrams per deciliter for glucose values below 100. And on top of that, 98% of results should meet those old um, requirements of plus or minus 20% or, or 15 mg per deciliter. So um, not only more stringent or tighter accuracy, but also um, two sets of guidelines, 95% of results within 12.5%, 98% that only less than 2% of results can exceed the 20% error tolerance from the old guidelines. And then in 2013 also, the ISO uh, 15197 document was revised. This is really a more of a guidance document for self-monitoring of blood glucose. And again, they chose the 15%, 15 mg per deciliter cutoffs that had been used by NACB, but also added in the use of Park's error grid analysis to really look at the clinical impact of errors in the context of self-management of blood glucose. Um, so now we keep going forward to September 2014. Uh, NOVA received approval of the stat strip, the first meter to be explicitly approved for use in uh, all, all hospitalized patients for venous and arterial whole blood, not capillary outside of neonatal heel stick capillary. In November 2014, CMS adding on to that statements by the FDA a few years before, sent a memo to the state surveyors that do CMS inspections, um, confirming that yes, if you are using a glucose meter and critically ill as an off-label use, makes it high complexity, you'd have to meet high complexity testing requirements, and that caused a tremendous amount of concern for hospitals. Um, interestingly, CMS later withdrew this memo, um, but uh, kind of a long story, it really didn't change the fact that it's still the view of CMS and FDA that unless you're using a meter explicitly approved for this patient population, it's off-label and you have to meet high complexity personnel and test requirements. And then finally, back in 2010, the FDA said new guidance is forthcoming, and it did. And this guidance applies to um, companies trying to get new technologies approved for glucose meters. And um, as alluded to in that 2010 public session, they did end up coming up with separate home and hospital use accuracy criteria. The FDA guidance for meter manufacturers for home use are a slightly more stringent version of the ISO 15197 documents, fairly similar, slightly more stringent than ISO 15197. And the hospital use are, are very similar to, but not identical to the CLSI POC 12A3 guidelines. So we have kind of a settle into this state where there are separate home and uh, hospital use guidelines and the hospital use more stringent at about that 12.5% error criteria and closer to the 15% in use of the parks error grid for the home use. So now we'll end uh, the last part of this talk with really trying to answer a simple question. All of this um, has legitimately brought up concerns about glucose meter accuracy in the ICU and the effectiveness of glycemic control. But the assumption is that, well, if we fix glucose meters, we'll get better patient outcomes. How do we really know whether improving glucose meter accuracy and reducing the types of interferences and outliers in glucose measurement in the ICU will really lead to better patient outcomes during glycemic control in the ICU? 
And I do like to start out by, by reminding people, because we're laboratorians and point-of-care folks, and we jump right to glucose meter accuracy, but there are many variables that will impact patient outcome. Do patients benefit from glycemic control that are besides the type of monitor and monitoring device or test to use to monitor glucose? Um, the target range is glucose target range is probably the most important. The evidence suggests that finding the right range is and the right sort of dosing algorithm is important. The sophistication of the dosing, dosing algorithm, is it point to point? Do you change the insulin dose with every measurement, or does it trend values over time? Consider two or three measurements before you change the insulin dose. Um, the, the system itself, is it electronic or manual? Um, and then uh, down, really down that list, in my view, in terms of importance, is the accuracy of the glucose monitoring device. It's important, but the range and the elements of the algorithm, the dosing algorithm, are probably more important. And then, of course, never to be forgotten, the competency and the quality of the overall point-of-care program. So again, we shouldn't jump just to the accuracy of the device. It's one variable uh, that we can control in the point-of-care program, but it probably isn't even the most important variable to be considered by the hospital or ICU practice. So again, we know tight glycemic control protocols are associated with this five-fold increased risk of hypoglycemia, and that's a concern. Um, but again, we, we can't jump and just say, well, that's because the glucose meters aren't accurate. When you really look in the institutional experiences, absolute rates of hypoglycemia using very similar types of protocols vary widely between centers doing tight glycemic control, from less than 1% using an older glucose meter technology, so older data now from Stanford Hospital, versus almost 20% in the Levon 2 study. So if two different centers using similar protocols and the same type of glucose meter and actually an older meter technology that did have more interferences uh, associated with it um, had such vastly different rates of hypoglycemia, again, rather than just assuming, oh, it's the meter, we really need to ask the opposite question. Does glucose meter accuracy have anything to do with the outcomes or effectiveness of glycemic control or rates of hypoglycemia in the context of intensive, intensive insulin uh, treatment? So that leads me to the review of a study we did here a couple of years ago where we really wanted to ask the question, can the newer glucose meter technologies that don't have the hematocrit and other interferences that are more accurate overall, um, can they reduce the error when we test fresh whole blood samples at the bedside in critically ill patients after cardiovascular surgery? There have been now at this time more studies done, but in the beginning when the newer technologies came out, a lot of them were benchtop studies where they weren't actually testing blood at the bedside in critically ill patients. If, if they do, is it because bias or imprecision is reduced? And then the important is a second question here. If we can reduce error and improve accuracy at the bedside in the ICU, is that going to improve the eff efficacy, effectiveness, and outcome of glycemic control in the ICU? And we specifically asked about the cardiovascular ICU. So at Mayo Clinic here, we replaced our um, older glucose meter technology, the AccuCheck-1, with the stat strip in October of 2012. We did a study to assess the effects of the newer technology on both accuracy and precision of glucose measurements in the ICU. The accuracy study, we did a retrospective study for precision, and one of the problems with precision studies is you often see it done with QC and you know, it doesn't really reflect bedside measurement. We did a precision study with two meters at the bedside. So this is the precision, the, this is the precision study. It was at the bedside. Um, we took 20 ICU patients and measured whole blood glucose five times with each patient with an older meter technology, the AccuCheck Inform 1, and we got a CV of 2%, pretty good, and an average glucose value of 142 mg per deciliter. We did the same experiment with the stat strip, and we got a CV of 2.7%, very similar. So precision was not an issue. It wasn't that the meters can't get the same answer twice when you test fresh arterial whole blood at the bedside. Both meters were precise, and so precision didn't seem to be an issue with um, 
in between one meter technology and another. To assess accuracy, we did a retrospective study. We looked at 1,600 paired, that is a, a um, meter whole blood value done within five minutes of drawing a serum for a Roche hexokinase lab reference value. And so three month period of 1,600 paired um, older informed technology to lab. And then over the three months after we implemented the newer technology, the stat strip, Again, the same study, almost 1,100 paired, that is collected within five minutes of each other, point of care, and lab glucoses. So this is the raw, sort of bland Altman plot of the raw data for the older technology. And you can see that the, value, the points are scattered. There's a systematic bias. And the median bias was 11 milligrams per deciliter and about a 10% uh, median bias. So the on average, the older uh, Inform 1 was running about 10, 11 mg per deciliter or 9% higher than the lab. And you can see a lot of variability. And as you get to higher glucose values, you tend to overestimate lab glucose more and more. This is the newer um, meter stat strip. And you can see there's almost no systematic bias, medium bias of 1 milligrams per deciliter or 1%. And almost all of the values uh, on the stat strip were within about 20 milligrams per deciliter of the lab value. So what we did with implementing a newer technology, the stat strip, we reduced systematic bias from about 11 milligrams per deciliter to 1 milligrams per deciliter. So we, we reduced systematic bias using a, a meter that detected and corrected the hematic rate interference and had fewer medication interferences. And this is just a percent of meter values that were within various criteria, 10% of the lab, 20% of the lab value, or the CLSI POCT 12A3 criteria, which I told you is kind of what people seem to be settling in, the FDA and other groups seem to be settling in as the most commonly used um, accuracy criteria for ICU or hospital use glucose meters. You can see only 55% of the older technology were then uh, values were within 10% of the lab versus almost 90% on the stat strip, the newer technology. Um, most of both 92% and 98% uh, of the old and new technology within 20% of the lab only or 69% of the informed values, the older technology, did meet the PLCT 12A3 criteria, whereas 95% of the stat strip values did. And so if you recall, the CLSI criteria is that 95% of the values meet those criteria. So the stat strip newer meter technology did meet CLSI criteria, whereas the older technology didn't. And so re by reducing systematic bias, we reduced the total error from about 20% with the older technology to just about exactly 12.5% with the stat strip. So that's one a retrospective study in our ICU. You might ask, well, is that going to be true or in larger studies? And there was very recently a prospective accuracy study published um, using data from five ICUs, two of those were in hospitals in the Netherlands, one in Belgium, and two U.S. sites. They covered a wide variety of patients, medical, surgical, burn ICU patients. The study had 1,800 paired measurements from almost 700 unique patients. And their findings were very um, similar. 96.1% did meet the CLSI POCT 12A3 criteria, so again, it met POC to uh, admit CLSI uh, criteria. 99% were in zone A of the Parks era grid, 100% between zones A and B. And most importantly, because one of the limitations of our studies here at Mayo is we our, our protocols work well, and we almost never have hypoglycemic patients, so we don't get a chance to see how accurate our meters are at lower glucose values, there was 99% concordance in characterizing hypoglycemia between the glucose meter, the stat strip, and the lab. So it was accurate across these different patient populations, and it was accurate at low glucose, which is obviously a concern in preventing hypoglycemia. <coughs> 
So there's that analytic data to show that improving the glucose meter technology gives you better, uh, reduces errors, reduces outliers, gives you improved accuracy. Now the second part of that question that I wanted to ask in our study, does it matter? There's a couple of ways you can answer the does it matter study. One is by looking at true outcome data, hot ICU or hospital mortality, bloodstream infections, renal failure. And we know from the published randomized trials, like the Dr. Vandenberg studies and others, you need about 1,000 patients to do that, so that's very resource intensive. The second question, though, you can ask, and it's a lot simpler, is what is the impact on glycemic control efficacy? And glycemic control efficacy are measures such as glycemic variability, how much does glucose values go up, drift up and down in a target range. The time spent within the target range, do the patients stay where you want them to be on glycemic control. Uh, incidence of hypo and hyperglycemia, and again, remember that hypoglycemia incidence or rate is a very important. And we've done, and other groups have done studies and, and done power in studies, and you can actually do this with between 50 and 150 patients per study arm, a much more sort of feasible type of study to do than an outcome-based study. So why would we want to measure glycemic control efficacy as opposed to outcome? Well, uh, again, because it's feasible, one, but we know hypoglycemia rates are extremely important, and so if improving accuracy or reducing errors leads to less hypoglycemia, that would be important to know. Um, again, we know hyperglycemia is important. That's what we're trying to avoid. So if you reduce hyperglycemia, that's important. And the amount of variability, how much glucose values go up and down, itself um, is important. There's an increasing amount of studies and literature suggesting that more glycemic variability in the ICU leads to worse outcomes. So just having glucose go up and down, the range and magnitude of those changes in glucose over time itself may be a risk factor for poor outcomes in the ICU. So we can measure the time in the target range and the incidence of hypo and hyperglycemia and glycemic variability and those that have increased time and range and decreased variability in hypo and hyperglycemia have a better, are, are more effective or efficacious glycemic control protocols and, and would likely result in better outcomes for patients. And so we ask the question, if we do nothing to our glycemic control protocol but change the type of meter we have and have a more accurate meter, will that impact glycemic control efficacy? So I just showed you the data, the pre and post data in our ICU. So we know that in the older, with the older glucose meter technology, we had about 20% total error, and we went to 12.5% total error. We know with the older meter technology, we were not meeting the CLSI guidelines for hospital accuracy, and with the new meter we were. And so could we measure an effect on glycemic control efficacy? So what we did is another retrospective study. We looked at a total of 140 patients who had anywhere from 12 to 24 consecutive, meaning within an hour, glucose values done in the cardiovascular surgery ICU, and were on glycemic control. So with each measurement in glucose, the insulin dose was changed according to what was then our glycemic control protocol. Um, again, the patients had all had 20, uh, all had 12 to 24 consecutive glucose values. Um, and each one was used to change insulin therapy. During period one, uh, we used the older glucose meter, AccuCheck and Form 1, to monitor glucose. Um, during period two, and there were 70 patients in that arm, during per period two, we used the newer technology, the stat strip, um, to measure glucose. But there are no other changes to the infusion protocol, the testing personnel, the system, to, um, of glycemic control other than the fact that we changed the glucose meters between periods one and period two. So what did we measure? We measured glycemic variability as measured by standard deviation and continuous overall net glycemic action or conga. Um, there are many measures of glycemic variability. We chose those two because they're the most sensitive to sort of short-term glucose meter or glucose variability, and we had 12 to 24 hours of data, not weeks or months. We measured the percent of values in the target range, which was 110 to 150 milligrams per deciliter was our target at that time. 
and we measured the rates or incidences of hypo and hyperglycemia. And this table just shows you baseline demographic data for period one and period two, and the ages of the genders of the patients didn't differ. We specifically, and I'll, I'll point this out, chose half patients without diabetes and half patients with type 2 diabetes during each period so we can separately assess the importance of glucose meter accuracy on both non-diabetic and patients with type 2 diabetic patients. And the median number of values, how many times we measure and adjust insulin, again, didn't change between patients. And on, on average, these patients had 21 or 22 consecutive glucose measurements and insulin changes based on those measurements. So again, we're asking, does the accuracy of those measurements impact glycemic control efficacy? And here's the data. I have medians and interquartile ranges here, but the bolding is the medians. So the actual median glucose value did decrease between uh, in period two compared to period one. So just changing the meter actually led to a slight decrease in the median glucose value. You can see the standard deviation, the variability of glucose, was significantly less, 21.6 mg per deciliter, and then decreased to 13.7 in period two. So glycemic variability measured by standard deviation and by conga, continuous uh, net glycemic action, um, both decreased significantly. And the time and target range increased from about 67% in period one with the older meter technology to almost 75% percent of the time spent in the target range with the new meter. So here's our, basically the evidence to show that um, just putting in a more accurate glucose meter system did uh, reduce median glucose and decreased variability in glucose values uh, for patients after cardiovascular surgery. So we broke this down. We had 35 non-diabetic patients and 35 patients with type 2 diabetes to see if the effect was larger or different with diabetics and non-diabetics. So you can see that um, the standard deviation did still did decrease, but not as much, about a 20% de change in glycemic variability among non-diabetic patients. And the time, in, the time in target range actually wasn't different for non-diabetic patients with the older, who had the older meter technology used for monitoring versus the newer. So the effect was sort of blunted in non-diabetic patients. And here are 35 patients who had type 2 diabetes. You can see these very large 40% changes in glycemic variability. And the time and target range went up substantially from about 62% using the older meter technology to almost 78%. So there seems to be the glucose meter accuracy seems to have a bigger effect on the glycemic control effectiveness of diabetic patients, and these are type 2 diabetes, than it does non-diabetics. But the net effect overall among the combined patient population was that um, the uh, glycemic control efficacy was improved. And here I already mentioned is where we, we see so little hypoglycemia here that we knew we weren't going to have a lot of, of, of you know, difference in our hypoglycemia rate. We only had one patient with a single hypoglycemic value during period one and no hypoglycemia observed during period two. Um, again, we don't have a lot of hypoglycemia with our glycemic control protocol, but for hyperglycemia, and we define that as over 200 mg per deciliter, there were 26 patients during period one who had one or more episodes of hyperglycemia and only six during period two. So you would expect that when you're getting less glycemic variability, more time and target range, you reduce your, ever, your rates of hyperglycemia by using a more accurate meter. And um, again, our study is a couple of years old now. We were one of the first to publish this in, in a patient population that, that showed that, yes, this accuracy does matter, and improving accuracy leads to better um, eff effectiveness or efficacy of glycemic control. There has now been um, a couple other studies. This is one published in a pediatric burn population. Very similar design, 63 patients monitored with an older technology, 59 with a newer technology. Had a lower glycemic target than ours, and so you'll probably why um, they were able to look at more impact on hypoglycemia. Um, but again, similar to what we showed, there was much more um, bias, 7.4 
makes Modesto universes a little under uh, about negative 1.7. So again, the more more systematic bias with the older technology versus the stat strip. And when they improved accuracy, glycemic control measured with a number of measures, conga, CV, mage, and mod, all um, decreased with the newer technology. The time to achieve therapeutic range went down substantially substantially from 13 to 5.7 hours, and the time in range increased substantially from 57.9 to 85.2. And I've given you the reference there, but you can see that again, now more and more the evidence is suggesting that yes, improving accuracy really is going to improve the efficacy of glycemic control, and here's now our study and a second that have shown that. So in conclusion, um, glucose meter use in the hospital um, has a lot of limitations still, and, and there are still issues and controversies out there. Um, capillary sampling is going to remain a hot controversial issue. One of, my, one, of, one of the issues I find most interesting, and we're really doing a lot of our studies, focusing on limitations and accuracy of capillary sampling in the ICU, and then hematocrit effects as the major issues that are out there. Um, we can use technology to address hematocrit effects and interferences. Um, for all of the controversy about capillary sampling, um, the limitations remain largely undefined, and we, again, we don't know how much is a technologic limitation and how much is a physiologic. But back to glucose meter use in the hospital, it is being done mostly in our institution and probably in yours for non-diabetic patients. There are tighter glucose ranges, often not as tight as they were um, in some of the early studies, but that means more opportunity to translate meter error into insulin dosing error. Um, sources of the error, hematocrit and medications, and sample differences will be more pronounced in these critically ill ICU patients than in a general hospital or home use population. And we've shown that uh, new glucose meter technologies can reduce the error of glucose measurement when it's used at the bedside on critically ill patients. And there is emerging evidence to suggest that improving the glucose meter accuracy, reducing error in the hospital, in the ICU, will in fact improve the efficacy of glycemic control in the hospital. So I would like to thank you all for paying attention and be happy to take any questions. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Brad Karen, and I hope you all enjoyed uh, the presentation today. I see there's a number of questions that are being submitted online or have been, and I will um, take those in the order I, I can get to those. And um, please do keep submitting questions you'd like me to address. So the first question that came in uh, was, what are the other options for glucose testing in the critically ill other than glucose meters, can venous blood be tested on a blood gas analyzer? And yes, so I mentioned in the Vandenberg study, arterial blood gas was sampled, but um, venous blood gas is, can be used on almost all blood gas analyzers. And the um, assumption that's often made is that blood gas analyzers will not be susceptible to the same type of interferences as meters. Although there are actually one, at least one publication I know of that show that different blood gas analyzers may have different hematocrit effects. And so you certainly are probably can assume uh, less interferences and good accuracy with a blood gas analyzer, but look at the data out there. There are a couple of other um, um, devices that can be used with venous blood. Um, or arterial blood, so the handheld devices that are not meters, so ISTAT, HemiQR examples. But again, you'll want to look at accuracy data from those devices. Just don't assume because they're not meters, they're going to be better than meters. There's data sets out there for most of these devices, and some may be significantly less susceptible to interferences and bias, and some may not be. So you'll want to look at what's the data of what the device you would like to use in place of a meter. Next question about the study design, were the lab samples truly serum or were the majority plasma? In the retrospective study I showed you, those were serum samples sent to our central laboratory. So we do serum testing in a central lab and plasma in the stat lab, so we've done both types of studies. 
So, um, yeah, we've, um, you know, these were serum, but we've done prospective studies using plasma. Um, the same person asked about, do we know if the study was able to eliminate the effects of glycolysis by leukocytosis or other causes as the causes of a discrepancy between the serum lab sample and the meter? In the retrospective study, again, they were serum studies. What most studies, our studies here and others published, have shown that when you're using serum and there's some delay, so there's going to be some glycolysis effect, particularly at least with respect to the NOVA device, you tend to get a slight positive bias between point of care and lab due to that effect of glycolysis, or a median bias might be one to two. And if you're actually using plasma samples, and, and we've done these where you use plasma and expedite within 15 minutes, get the result from the lab, you tend to see a slight negative bias. So we've actually seen a slight effect there, but we have never seen an outlier caused by glycolysis um, in our studies anyway. So it has a slight effect on the systematic bias, but um, glycolysis in our hands does not cause something to be an outlier. Um, other questions? So is the preanalytical error from capillary samples generally higher than with the venous and arterial? Um, yes, all the data would suggest that, and that's one of the reasons why capillary sampling is so um, controversial. There's going to be more preanalytic errors, er errors with capillary sampling. Um, I'm trying to take these in order. Submitted is the initial blood gas. What was the initial blood gas values in period one were the same as period two? How long was each period? Each period was about six months. But no, we didn't look to see if the patient started at the same glucose. It was however they got to the ICU. So that would have differed between period ones and period two. A couple of people asked about our definition of critically ill at Mayo Clinic. And um, again, these studies were done in a cardiovascular ICU. And they were immediately post-surgical on the first day post-op. Um, in general, if you're asking about how we define critically ill for use of our meters every day, um, what our institutional definition is settled on is um, critically ill is a patient in one of our ICUs who has an arterial or central venous catheter. And so with that's, we have a critical care specialty council, and they gave us that definition to use, which makes it easy to figure out who can have a capillary sample and who doesn't. Uh, another caller asking about if I have any information on the INFORM2 studies of comparing INFORM2 and STATRASTRIP. We have not, I myself have not used the INFORM2. It's actually been on my sort of to-do list. Um, I'm not aware of a lot of head-to-head -head studies between STATRASTRIP and INFORM2, but there are other large retrospective studies of INFORM2, and they look pretty similar to the retrospective studies that we and others have published with STATRASTRIP. Um, I think Dr. Tran in, in, in California may have done a, some small head-to-head -head studies, um, but there aren't a lot out there, and that's something we would actually like to do in the near future. Another question, hemolysis doesn't play a role, uh, correct? Well, I don't think we know. We never know how hemolyzed these specimens are, but I think most of the manufacturers are doing studies that shows hemolysis doesn't have a major impact. So no, I wouldn't say that's a major pre variable we have to worry about. Right. Um, question, do you think we need to define different, more tight panic values than used in the laboratory for the capillary samples used in point of care? Um, you know, I think for some Practices have tried to, you know, get confirmations of capillary values, knowing they're made more susceptible to error, that are tighter. Um, I don't know you need to do much differently, though. Um, most places, because of the dangers of hypoglycemia, have taken a treat and repeat rather than confirm. And so that's probably the way to go, even with capillary, although maybe you want to, you know, both treat and repeat and confirm with a different sample at the same time when you have a low capillary. Um, high capillaries, like high venous blood, and over 400 we confirm before dosing insulin. I don't know that you necessarily need to do anything differently. 
Um, when looking at critically ill, should patient condition be more of a concern versus where the patient is roomed? Very sick patients could be monitored all over. Should the emphasis be on patient rather than specific unit? In terms of if your question is about capillary sampling, I think that is the big question. We've done two prospective studies, one in the OR, one in the ICU, on capillary sampling accuracy. And again, I didn't talk about those today, but I think a lot of the conventional wisdom about who is a, likely to have an accurate capillary glucose values are, are not accurate. We looked at temperature and blood pressure and a number of variables, both in the OR, capillary refill, and the OR and ICU, and they really don't predict who is going to be an outlier. So it makes it very difficult. I don't know there's a good answer right now. And as I mentioned briefly, that's kind of one of my major areas of interest for research right now. Back down, okay. Should the end user, in particular nurses, be responsible for maintaining the quality control for the glucometer? Um, yes, if you follow accreditation and CMS standards, then yes, the person who uses the device every day should be the one doing the QC. Do we repeat critical glucoses on the NOVA meter? Um, do you, or do we repeat critical glucoses on the NOVA meter? If so, the, do the results match? Well, again, um, we do uh, get a stat plasma sample for every NOVA value over 400. And um, they, yes, they generally, I don't think we've ever seen uh, plasma that a meter over 400 come back under 400 on a plasma. For hypoglycemic, and I think this is more and more common, I mentioned previously because of the dangers hypoglycemia, we just don't confirm them anymore. Glucose is under 70, they treat and repeat. Dextrose is benign therapy. Hypoglycemia in the hospital is a bad thing, so um, maybe we're wrong, but we'd rather give dextrose and be wrong than have the patient go on being hypoglycemic. How do we ensure our staff is testing venous blood, not capillary, on our critically ill definitions? Well, um, we've not audited it um, intensively. Um, because our policy is that the critically ill patient for purposes of capillary sampling is somebody in the ICU who has an arterial venous line, we simply instruct our SAS staff if they have a venous or arterial line, you have to use that line rather than a capillary sample. Do we use meters in the emergency department? Um, yes, we do use them in the emergency department. Very rarely capillary sampling, though, because everybody gets a blood draw in the ED, so you really don't have to do capillary sampling in the ED. Uh, somebody asked to repeat the definition of critically ill, so it's a patient in the ICU who has an arterial or central venous catheter is defined as critically ill. Is ISO 15197 for soft testing? Yeah, that's the intention of the ISO 15197 was a guide for manufacturers of meters used for self-monitoring of blood glucose. And let's see. There's a question about the insulin drip and um, a safer way of controlling than uh, insulin drip. Well, I, you know, I, I guess I, I can certainly understand that. I think. If you're going to do glycemic control, you have to do it well. And otherwise, if you're not going to put the resources into managing your glycemic control, you shouldn't do insulin drips. Asking if we see significant glucose swings in the NICU. Um, we do very little blood gas analysis in the NICU. We tend to, in the NICU, again, I didn't cover that topic in our today's presentation, but because they do frequent ABGs, we tend to do most um, blood gas glucose in the NICU, not uh, meters. And um, guidelines, again, another question about guidelines for classifying critically ill. It's an institutional definition. It's not, so yeah, it's whatever your institution says it is, and I told you what, what we've done. Uh, and I think I should probably Stop there. Um, well, one more. In general, what percentage, percentage of diabetic patients 
but hypoglycemia, we're aware of the hypoglycemia in the Mayo studies. Um, well, we, in our studies, we had very little hypoglycemia. We do have a diabetic team that monitors hypoglycemia, and in general, few of them do realize that, and that's a problem in the hospital, that the classic symptoms often aren't there. So I think with that, we're actually, I think, a little bit over the hour, and um, I will stop there, and I thank you all for your attention.